I'm Nan Vaughan. I'm an Associate Professor of Climate Change at the Tyndall Centre at UEA. And I work on ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which is kind of part of the way we'll get to zero emission. I'm Nick Brooks. Um, I'm a visiting research fellow at the Climatic Research Unit here at UEA. And I also run Garama 3C Limited, which is a small consultancy firm that focuses mostly on adaptation and international development. Uh, we advise governments and other organisations, particularly at the strategic level, about how to think about and frame and do adaptation uh, sort of globally on the ground and so on. So we've just had the big IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report has come out and I um, contributed to the one before that, the fifth assessment report. I was uh, brought in as a contributing author on mitigation. Um, I think it was chapter six. And what about you, Nick? What was your involvement in the IPCC? So similar to you, really. So this was back in 2007, which I think was the uh, fourth assessment report. Uh, and I was brought in quite late after reviewing the Africa chapter for working group two. Um, and they presumably liked my review and they asked me to be a contributing author. So... Uh, yeah, very quite a low-level input, really. Uh, and I think both of us now are really more users, aren't we, of the IPCC than uh, contributors. So we're, we're seeing it from the other end uh, these mm. days. Definitely. And I think I use it in quite a few different ways as well, dip into different parts of it. Obviously, the IPCC has these uh, like three main reports. And within the reports, there's stuff. I mean, I find myself discovering things that I hadn't even realised were in there. I don't know about you. Um, but um, I use it a lot in my teaching but I use it as a kind of quick way to get up to speed on something outside of my direct expertise. So I mostly spend my time, I suppose, digging around in working group three and a little bit in working group ones, but you're more, is it working group two? More working group two on sort of impacts, vulnerability, adaptation. And uh, yeah, similarly, um, largely aware of a lot of the stuff that goes in there, but when it comes out, there's always this mad scramble to see what the state of the art of the thinking is and make sure that you're up to date, particularly if you're doing any, any training or seminars or, or teaching. Uh, around a particular topic, then the IPCC is usually my go-to to make sure I'm up to date with the science and the literature. I always find it quite funny when it like drops, if you like, originally, right? Because you get like, sometimes the press has got almost like the best up to date and you do the summary and then other colleagues that you know have done the deep dive into the chapter that's relevant on your stuff, right? It's quite a flurry. It feels kind of like a mad flurry. There's just so much to it. It's such a kind of a beast of a thing, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's 2013, 2014 um, when the previous report came out. Uh, yeah, I think it dropped a few days before I was delivering some training. So um, I had this uh, rather sleepless night making sure I was up to date. And if people want to know what's in the IPCC report, everybody's talking about it. So uh, yeah, that, that was a bit stressful, but that's, that's sort of how it is. Uh, we should know a lot of the content anyway, because I think it's worth emphasising isn't it, that the IPCC is not new science. It's a synthesis of the existing literature. But there's an enormous amount of work that goes in there. And as an individual, there's always stuff that you miss. And also the way it's packaged in terms of messaging, it really sort of highlights what the, uh, you know, collectively the authorship of the IPCC uh, deemed to be the most significant uh, aspects of the literature um, and the science. Yeah, definitely. And I find that uh, I also go particularly looking for figures, like imagery and figures. And I feel that they put, it feels to me like the IPCC has put a lot of work in the last two, so like the, the quality of those has really gone up, but I'm really thankful for that because I use them a lot. And then you see them uh, in teaching, but often in academic conferences used as that kind of starting point. But I find from my stuff in adaptation, it's these scenarios, like where are things going, that then get used a lot. That's the thing I see most like replicated. Like, well, what is the, it's never called business as usual, but what is the like business as usual and what are the other options? And it's often these graphics that start the conversation for a lot of people and a lot of users. And sometimes that can be a bit of challenge. Within adaptation, um, is there any particular kind of image or graphic that gets used a lot or is it certain kind of facts and figures that get used a lot in your yeah, space? Yeah, I think, uh, so for me, the key things are the ever-evolving definitions of adaptation, vulnerability, resilience, adaptive capacity, these sorts of terms, and every report has a slightly different definition. They evolve. Uh, so, for example, um, the IPCC had this definition of vulnerability, which was sort of partly compatible with and partly in conflict with traditional definitions of risk, and it's moved more to a risk framing in more recent reports. So that's really interesting. Um, the other thing, well, actually related to that, there are always uh, diagrams about risk. There are these sort of propeller diagrams, we often call them, looking at the components of risk, how risk is comprised of exposure to hazards, vulnerability, sensitivity, ability to adapt, and so on. So that's my go-to to see what the current IPCC framing of risk is. Uh, and how the definitions are evolving. They're, they're probably the first things I look at, really, for any report. I find it funny, right? All that volume of work. So these things take about, what do you reckon, about six or seven years from start to end? Yes. And that volume of work, that huge amount of scientific literature that's trying to be kind of like summarised and pulled together 
and then even ourselves working in that space dip into the kind of key headlines from the summary and a couple of figures so it's quite i think that's got a challenge for the ipcc in terms of people saying oh it should cover this it should cover that and you actually go digging around in the reports and, and this and that there. are there right yeah. they're there yeah. and you're like oh okay it's just that it's quite a challenge as to what gets pulled out or how it gets used um thinking about that time frame then i'm interested you know reflecting on the next ipcc kind of cycle that we're at the beginning of for the seventh assessment report um you know we're sat here today and it's nice and sunny but we've had quite an interesting uh kind of summer of uh climate impacts it feels like there are many more climate impacts coming along at a faster rate just as a kind of regular you know citizen in real life it feels like that and yet this process because of the body of knowledge and the vast amount of work that has to get done to bring that together takes quite a long time frame and we're you know in 2023 a seven-year cycle puts us at 2030 i'm getting a kind of increasing sense of kind of mismatch between that this process that's really important and has a really important role and then and yet like almost like the pace the pace of climate impacts but also the the pace of considerations then about adaptation that you work in but also for me the kind of uh, the stuff around mitigation how we reduce our emissions so looking at how many electric vehicles are on the road here in the uk now the kind of massive growth of solar across the world you know like some of the change feels fast some of the change feels far too slow um around say fossil fuel um and so i feel like there's almost like a, a time scale kind of mismatch that's emerged that feels more important that make the, or that there's more of a difference now between the pace of things and the discussions we're having about how to deal with climate change how to live with climate change um but also the impacts we see versus this this kind of the pace that the um ipcc reports kind of work at no, it makes a lot of sense actually so uh, i remember the days when Although we were aware that climate change was unfolding, we were seeing observed warming, and um, we were thinking of a lot of the the big impacts from climate change as things that would happen in the future. Uh, and so when we're thinking about the IPCC reports, we're looking at, well, what do we expect? What can we anticipate? What are the projections saying? Well, I think we're at the stage now where climate change and the impacts of climate change are unfolding, intensifying, evolving more rapidly than the IPCC publication process is happening. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a real issue now. How does the IPCC sort of stay relevant in that context. So if I think back to the last few reports, then we've got a lot, and this is your field, so uh, <laughs> I won't say too much, to, and do feel free to correct me, but um, we have all of these sort of emissions pathways or trajectories that are compatible with, you know, saying below the 1.5 degree Celsius temperature threshold or goal of the, uh, that was in trying to the Paris Agreement, and then the two degree goal. Uh, so obviously, um, as I think a lot of people watching this will know, Initially, there was an agreement we should stop warming um, of more than about two degrees, and then that was revised down so that the limit for, and I won't say safe level of warming, but to avoid, you know, systemically dangerous climate change, we have to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. So uh, we see all these curves about, you know, what we need to do with emissions in order to achieve this. Um, By the time the next IPCC report comes out, we may well have actually breached that 1.5 degree threshold anyway. So so what does that say about all that work that's been going on about how do we stay below 1.5 degrees? Well, we haven't. So the IPCC will have to sort of rethink that. Um, And I know you'll have a lot of thoughts about about those curves and the role of things like uh, carbon dioxide capture and carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere uh, and the big role those play in those um, emissions pathways that keep us below these temperature thresholds and how realistic they are. Maybe I should hand back to you to say something about that and then I can sort of say something about the adaptation context in, in terms of this timescale mismatch. Yeah, no, you, you've captured that well. And that this, for me, that is one of the kind of cr- stickiest points about this kind of timescale mismatch, if you like, between the IPCC and, and our lived reality of climate change now is that we're going to have a really warm year this year, but next year it will probably be warmer because of El Nino that we're moving into. And 1.5 is you know, a really useful and helpful way of bringing as a shorthand, right, for loads of different climate impacts and climate changes that are all very different in localised places. But we will get to a stage where we will have a year that breaches 1.5 or you will have a month that does first and then a year, right? And so what th- there's a sticky space there about well, what does that mean for the impacts at 1.5? That, like the 1.5 is used in different ways over different timescales, even within the different types of science. And so we have our nationally determined contributions that set out the kind of level of action that different countries are going to take by 2030. 
And when the next IPCC report comes out, we're at the, we're at the back end of that. We've got this global stock take process, which is kind of taking these uh, a stock take of where we're at relative to that kind of ambition and what we have achieved and what trajectory we're heading in. But yeah, there definitely is a problem around the 1.5 in terms of the kind of carbon budget. Like, well, how much CO2 can we put in the atmosphere and still get to 1.5? The way that that works now with a kind of smooth transition is that you have to rely on these like novel technologies to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it deep underground and that's that's the space that is a lot of the focus of my research um obviously you can uh plant more trees and change your agricultural management which will contribute but um the basically the more we delay the more we delay our stop burning fossil fuels the more you're relying on those kind of technologies afterwards to mop it up so it becomes really um it becomes really tricky about those conversations about where that balance is and what those time frames are um and in some ways it starts to for me burst outside of the scope of the ipcc to summarize the science because it becomes about at a nation state and within a nation state what what are we going to do to get to net zero you know like what are we going to do with our transport sector what are we going to do with our heating what are we going to do about um how we generate our electricity and and that's different for each country based on their geography based on their trade relationships you know like um and so i suppose that you must also get that with um with adaptation that like ipcc works at this like global it's another mismatch it's another a, mismatch a, a, a right spatial mismatch as well yeah we have the temporal mismatch and we've got a spatial mismatch in that the ipc as you're saying i think um operates at the global it's basically a global report so it does have um, chapters on regions, on climate impacts and projections, uh, you know, in, in Africa, uh, Europe, North America, South America, and so on. Um, so it's basically a global and regionally focused report. But as you were saying, the actual actions that we need to take to address climate change, whether it's, you know, mitigation, reducing our emissions, or whether it's through adapting to the impacts, they, well, they are sort of, I think, framed and informed by sort of global policy contexts. Um, they happen at the national scale and below. The national, the subnational, and the local scale. These are the scales at which people do the things that, you know, hopefully get us to net zero, um, that enable them to adapt. And so there's a question again for the IPCC, given it's a, a sort of a global report with, you know, regional components, how does it and how can it support actions at these smaller scales? And it can't sort of do the projections for every little local area. Uh, but maybe it can help to frame how we think about that sort of stuff. Um, so when we're thinking about adaptation, and again, this is about both the temporal and the spatial mismatch, I think. Um, I do a lot of work on international development and adaptation in international development programs and projects. And most of that is very, very sort of incremental. Mostly people are, you know, at best adapting to climate as it is. Now, the climate is evolving and changing. But there's very, actually very little focus on um, how people adapt and prepare for the changes that may be coming. Um, so there's very, very little ambition and very, very little attention to what could be large and even existential risks. You know, we have all these projections of wet bulb temperatures that may be unsurvived by human beings in the, you know, around the middle of the century and onwards uh, in large parts of the world that home hundreds of millions of people. I think very few people are thinking about that, although the science is there, and that is an existential risk to these populations and areas. Um, so we need a massive step up in ambition to go from this sort of incremental approach to adaptation where we're trying to sort of protect what we've got by doing, you know, deploying measures that we are already familiar with, for example, a bit more irrigation, um, you know, changing planting times, whatever of crops, um, to really think about, well, how do we how do we sort of survive if we can't do what we're doing now in the future because of climate change? So that's sort of transformational adaptation mm. in, in the lingo, um, you know, when you have to abandon or replace a current system or practice with something new because the novel climate conditions won't allow you to do what you're doing now. And that might also include abandoning certain areas, relocation, uh, resettlement, relocation of economic activity, um, infrastructure, populations, and so on. And this is really, really challenging stuff. So again, that, that sort of the temporal mismatch as related to adaptation ambition. But also there's this issue of the fact that adaptation mostly happens at the local scale. And while the IPCC can't sort of look at every location in the world and, and help people to understand what they might do to adapt there, it can maybe review and synthesize our knowledge and best practice about how you support local adaptation, how you support local adaptation governance, how you actual, actually channel climate finance down to the local level, 
Uh, there's a statistic I had recently, only about 10% of adaptation finance gets to the local level. So, so these are all things that, that I think we need to pay more attention to because these are going to be the challenges um, that we need to wrestle with as climate change accelerates, as the impacts intensify, and as adaptation becomes really, really urgent. Uh, that was quite a long monologue for me, so I'm <laughs> going to let you talk. <laughs> So, that, so we start, we start off talking about our temporal mismatch, our time, time scale mismatch, and we kind of segued into one about spatial and thinking about where these changes happen. And I think that's really relatable um, for uh, adaptation. But I also hear a lot of, I hear a lot. It, it resonates with me a lot around mitigation. Do you know what I mean? The the features of a of a country and of areas within a country that enable it to to find a, a fix around heating and cooling quite easily versus it's really difficult changes around uh, transportation for example whether it's just not just replacing uh, uh, not just replacing cars and vehicles powered by uh, diesel and petrol but this um, to EV but also the the bigger job of infrastructure yeah. right infrastructure and um, uh, more walking and cycling suddenly it really matters the, the geography of your country how connected it is the kind of density of your spaces some places lend themselves really easily to that mm. and others that's more challenging. Um, and so as you start unpacking the kind of taking action on climate change, reducing emissions, actually the hard work of how you get into the zero, um, then it's different in each, it different, different in each place. So again, like, I think there's something about, um, not the IPCC staying in its lane, but, but just being respectful of what it can do versus what it can't do. And it can't be the answer for how every country should decarbonize. So within chapter working group three, there are these scenarios that explore what might be possible at a global scale, but they are not predictions of what country X or country Y should do. And that's not their role. Does that make sense? Because once you get down to that country scale, it's for assessments and kind of knowledge to come together at that scale. Um, so sometimes when I hear people say, oh, the IPCC should or should, I'm like, yeah. I think it does a good job of where it's at, which is this global to regional look. And like you said, pulling out some kind of transfer of best practice or key things to keep in mind, the kind of framing of the conversation. But most of that, action on climate mm. change uh, it's so for me that's action in terms of reducing emissions and making these big transitions in terms of how we power our um our lives is um is going to play out at a kind of national and sub-national scale and so um i think there's a it's funny using the phrase transformative adaptation because people talk a lot about the transformations that are needed in uh, how we generate electricity transformation needed in how we power our transport transformations needed in our kind of built environment you know that word transformations is uh is applied a lot across both of our very loosely up. yes yeah. both of our remit so we've covered a kind of mismatch around time scales and we've covered a mismatch around spatial scales it's kind of recognizing what the ipcc can do and should do and could do but also recognizing uh the where where it's kind of job if you like stop yeah. You know, and where that scale, you know, where, where it's the, the job of other kind of uh, scales and other sources of information to fill in those gaps. And I wonder then about, that makes me reflect a little bit on like, what's the purpose of the IPCC and who the users are. So we started talking about how we've contributed in the past to assessments, but we also talked a lot about how you and I use the IPCC output. But there's lots of different people who use the IPCC output in different ways, right? So it's, you know, it's fodder for um, uh, press, in these kind of peak moments, um, it's an authoritative text for people to go and check in on what the latest, latest science is, um, on the latest understanding. Um, but it also has that role because it is intergovernmental, right? Of having, and particularly the synthesis, the summary for policymakers, like it has to be neutral of politics. It has to have this like apolitical role, the kind of the tricky spot it finds itself in. That is part of the like lived reality for the IPCC process is it has this global, supposedly slightly apolitical like kind of consensus right makes it kind of neutral and in the middle which gives it a lot of power and authority and authority yeah. and that in itself has a huge value but it does also give it some limits because yeah. if we think about our mitigation actions and our adaptation these are happening in our local areas our local communities um and our like within our or, or they're not happening or they're <laughs> not happening but, yeah. but that at that scale it's a very they are political decisions yeah right and they are about balancing a set of other you know where climate in each decision is only one part of the story right climate mm -hmm. mitigation is one part of the decision climate adaptation is one part of the decision but there are lots of other agendas around health and around uh, biodiversity loss and job creation and community i mean there's lots of other agendas where the decisions then get made climate's only often one aspect we see this a lot in the areas that i work where people are 
you know, contending with lots of urgent sort of development needs, you know, just getting sort of you know, clean water to people, um, providing energy uh, to populations that you know, don't have access to uh, reliable energy sources uh, and dealing with you know, natural disasters in vertical commas, um, often which have a climate component. Um, so climate change sort of gets into that mix uh, and, and it's often deprioritized. I think we're seeing it here in this country as well at the moment, aren't we? It's being yeah. deprioritized because people are talking about, you know, cost of living, energy crisis and so on. So, of course, climate change is related to that. And we probably, if we address the climate crisis effectively in the UK, we could also address these other issues. But that's not always how politicians think about it or frame it or present it, you know, for the purposes of political advantage. So I think this you're absolutely right to highlight this other area of sort of a political mismatch we can say so um and to me the biggest issue now is is one of politics so we know the science of climate change obviously there are things around impacts and details carbon budgets are still uncertain um but we have a good understanding of the science of climate change we have a good understanding of the technologies that will enable us to to mitigate uh, and not just technology but also changes in behavior and policy and so on we have the the understanding of the science and the technical aspects uh, we actually know what changes we need to make in order to address it, but we're not getting from one to the other. And so there's this big sort of missing middle, or there's this gap, yeah. and that is to do with politics and political economy. Uh, so the main barrier and the main challenge now is to you know, unblock those political log jams and to, and to get from the knowledge to the action. So it seems to me that that's where, where the focus needs to be. So there's a question of, you know, whether the IPCC can play a role there. It is, you know, avowedly apolitical in its remit. But there is a lot of literature on uh, things like, you know, climate litigation, on um, the, you know, levers that you might sort of press to try and affect social change, on social innovation, um, the, the triggers for transformation and so on. And a lot of this is actually already in the IPCC, scattered around. So um, I, I sort of half seriously... Uh, we have a we have a summary for policymakers. Um, the policymakers sort of some of them are doing what they can, some of them aren't bothering, um, some of them are sort of you know paying lip service. There's a lot of lip service paid to the IPC, IPCC, and the science um, that doesn't let, then get translated into meaningful action, even around sort of net zero. There's a lot of rhetoric. We even have the policies, but they're not necessarily being implemented. And you'll know more about this than I will. Yeah, we have this sort of political gap though. Um, so. Yeah, as I was saying, sort of half half jokingly, we have a summary for policymakers. I'd quite like to see a, pol a summary for activists, <laughs> and it's not something the IPC will ever do because that'd be too political. I wonder if a third party might do that. Um, but I think there is a serious question there about to what extent the IPCC engages with the sort of drivers of change uh, and maybe includes in its review um, some of these aspects about the sort of miti missing middle of political action. Could we have a sort of a chapter on, um, you know, what are the main barriers and, uh, you know, what, where do we have examples of success and so on? Um, and I think it's critically important, but there's a big question as to the extent to which the IPCC can actually engage with that. Well, that goes back to this yeah. the kind of this apolitical yeah. versus political space. And it's this kind of along with our uh, kind of uh, observation about a spatial mismatch. There is a, a mismatch there in, in or just a recognition, at least, that what the IPCC's role and where it gets a lot of its authority from is partly that kind of consensus and that slightly uh, apolitical space. And yet there is a lot of frustration in wider society around this obvious, like you say, almost like an, a gap in action, right? We know we know, we know, know what we need to know about the fact that change, the climate is changing and we know what we need to do about how to address that. Um, and yet it's still not happening. So people will talk about things like um, that there's a, a lack of political will. There's a, you know, there's a real um, need for leadership and that the, the leadership's missing. Um, and in a way, that's kind of, we're going to see that highlighted with the global stock take between the promises from the NDCs, like the promises that and versus what's actually happening. And there'll be different discussions about how much of that, you know, uh, who has agency over that change. But, you know, that's, that again, going back to our temporal mismatch, it kind of feels like that's getting a kind of tighter and tighter spot to be in. You know, the it really matters. Every half a degree matters and, you know, every tonne of carbon matters um, in making it less of a problem. There's less impacts, you know, and less less extremes. And so um, the um, so they all kind of loop together, the ones we've raised then, right? We've talked about a, a temporal mismatch between the kind of how the IPCC itself works versus our lived experience of climate change today. Um, a spatial mismatch between the scale that the IPCC works at, which is global, but actually the action 
you know, and the kind of getting on with it is it's happening locally and, and nationally and, and maybe what we call sub-nationally, so within regions or states or provinces within a, re- um, within a country. Um, there's not, and there's other ways of doing it too, like the kind of cities programs where different, you know, the kind of sharing of best practice and ideas. There's other organisations that go outside of that shape of a, a country and try to connect up and uh, learn from one another. But again, with that comes this recognition that that climate change, you know, the emissions reduction, the kind of the action to get us to net zero and also the action to, and to adapt, to live with the changes, play out in a very political space, which is, you know, multiple different kind of countries and locations and what people are dealing with now in those places. And I think the overlap between these mismatches is really, really important. So we talked about the sort of, well, we talked about the fact that, you know, impacts are happening much more rapidly now, Uh, you know, year on year, month on month, we're seeing more really dramatic impacts, often ones that we didn't expect to happen until much later. Um, And compared this to the seven year cycle of the IPC, seven years, you know, who knows what type of impacts we would have experienced. so, and there's also this rather glacial pace of policy and, and sort of change in terms of you know, actually doing adaptation, doing mitigation. Uh, the approach that we have from you know, international organizations, from governments and so on, is really, really incremental. And that's understandable because change is difficult. Um, but I think looking ahead to the next COP, it looks like that incrementalism is almost going to be sort of cemented. We have a COP that's where the president is also, I think, the uh, chief executive of the national sort of oil and gas uh, operator um and there's a lot of discussion around now about um again the increasing emphasis on you know carbon dioxide removal and how this is being used by the fossil fuel industry as basically a justification um for continuing operating for not reducing emissions because like oh that's all right we just take it out of the atmosphere after we've emitted it and i saw um a clip on twitter or whatever it's called that uh al gore giving a presentation about this and he was talking about precisely this issue um so in a way we've got this political mismatch this fact that the barriers are political is now actually amplifying the the temporal mismatch because the politics is and it always has been slowing down action so the the political mismatch is feeding into the temporal mismatch and this in turn feeds into the spatial mis- space mismatch um because you yeah, know we know that a lot of this action is subnational and local um but because governments aren't taking the actions they need to, increasingly people are going to be on their own. <laughs> so how we actually get support to the local level for people who are essentially not being served by their you know, political representatives and governments um, is a really, really critical issue. So we have um, action being deliberately slowed down, um, deliberate obstacles being put in place of mitigation in particular um, by political interests, which mean that the temporal mismatch increases and those obstacles actually amplify the impacts that people are going to have to deal with at the local level. And so they need additional support there. So these these three areas of mismatch all, all overlap. Um, and actually, that's quite a big problem. Um, so again, um, the question is, what can the IPCC do to speak to this? Maybe it can't. Um, but it's something that I think for the next round, it needs to be considering. Yeah. I don't think I'd, I'd go for some element of like, accepting where its boundaries are be like you know at least acknowledging that and pointing pointing out that it's not not the answer for all situations i also think just to turn a little bit of hope in that as a bit of a kind of lift um is that when when you find that kind of action uh missing you know at your kind of local level or your national level what i find um what I find heartening is the amount of kind of groundswell that then has to come from the grassroots, has to come from communities. And this can be in very different shapes if you, you know, in the very different ways, but um, uh, they're not all necessarily driven by a singular focus on climate change, but where some aspects of climate change mitigation or um, adaptation or impacts is kind of having an effect on communities and communities then coming together to address that and work on that and trying to, you know, trying to kind of push back and, and be that, um and take that action and then there's actions that people can take as individuals too but um there's only so much individuals can do because you're working within those bigger structures um but i think it's also i think it's important to kind of to find those moments of of hope and if you look around the kind of i find the best practice sharing whether that's at a community scale or whether that's at like a city scale you know and demonstrating so if you take paris as an example of what you really can do with the right bit of leadership in place you know the pace of change you can see around mobility in central uh, Paris in terms of um, like the cycling infrastructure that's gone it you know like kind of commitment like that 
you see what's possible and you think, well, if you translate that to here, here and here, that would make a make a big difference. So again, I think some of these initiatives where um, cities learn from one another or communities in similar situations learn from one another are, um, are a space that's a bit more hopeful. Um, but at the same time, I think what we're going to see increasingly is um, as part of this, I think we kind of pointed towards it earlier in our conversation around this kind of action gap is is holding uh, people's, um, uh, you know, holding people to account, holding people and organisations to account in terms of their, shall we call it greenwashing, whether that's a, a national scale, or we're going to get to net zero uh, without a plan, or whether that's um, companies claim making claims about stuff, you know, um, people aren't stupid. People know when it's, you know, um, probably made up, probably baseless, um, and versus pe- um, situations where there is genuine effort and real, you know, energy to go um, go into that and make that. And so that hold us to account. So whether it's through the, you know, you've got processes through the global stop take, looking at the NDCs and progress towards that. But you have other kind of like the UN gap report, looking at the emissions gap. You have other net zero tracker. There are other kind of organizations and groups um, global in their scope or, or um, voluntary or not in their scope who are trying to hold to account. And I think that is something that's quite powerful with uh, a society um, uh, able to do that with like citizen science, you know, like keeping um, that kind of push for transparency and then using that um, to hold people to account and push for change. I think the RPC sort of has a role here, not directly, um, but by collating the state of the art of knowledge about impacts and risks, for example, um, that can inform and motivate people. Um, although all of the literal this in the case that if people are just see a risk to something but they don't feel they can do anything about it then it's, it's disempowering but an action happens where people perceive a risk to something they value but also perceive that they have the agency the ability to do something to reduce or remove that risk um so the ipcc does play a key role there in highlighting risks to systems and, and you know things that people value uh it probably doesn't have a direct role in holding governments to account um but it can be used in that sense again that's why, going back to my idea of a summary for activists, that would be quite useful. <laughs> yeah. what, what can you take from the IPCC that will help motivate action at your local level? But I think there are things the IPCC can do in its sort of review of the literature. Um, you talked about sort of, I think, best practice and so on. So if we look, and it, this must also exist in mitigation, but if we look at adaptation, then there are, for example, you know, quite a number of, of sets of principles that people have designed for good adaptation in different contexts, at different scales. Um, so... That's the type of thing the IPCC could summarise. Um, we sort of did that, I think, for, for last year's Adaptation Gap report. We tried to summarise some good adaptation principles and distill them down into a, a sort of shorter set of principles. That sort of stuff is quite useful because it's something people can go to, find quite easily, and then go, oh, well, if we want to do adaptation, then the, these are the ways that we, these things we need to consider. These are the criteria we need to meet. Um, we could also uh, look at things like how we track the, the performance of adaptation and the success of adaptation. This is something I think is that's quite missing from the IPCC report so far, although no doubt someone will say, oh, it, it's buried here and I've just missed it. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really aware of there being a lot there. But a lot of that stuff is happening, you know, at the practitioner level rather than, than being done by academics. Um, and there's a lot of grey literature, I'll bring some of it. Um, and, and that could be sort of summarised. So there's a lot of discussion around what successful adaptation looks like. Um, and success is going to be different to different people because they have different priorities, different goals. The way adaptation is measured at the moment tends to be, oh, have we spent the money? Have we provided support to these people? Um, and have we, you know, improved these aspects of their lives that we're going to say makes them more resilient, often without much evidence? Uh, but there are other ways of tracking adaptation in relation to um, the outcomes in terms of things like, you know, food security, water security, well-being, health, uh, in relation to the evolving sort of climate risks. Um, and I think the IPCC could play a, a role in sort of synthesizing this sort of stuff. So provide some practical guidance for people by synthesizing the literature in areas that are maybe a little bit un- underrepresented. So what does good adaptation look like? Uh, how do we track it? Um, how do we support local adaptation? What are the successful mechanisms that, that can channel support to the local level? Uh, and that's an area um, that's also sort of a great interest at the moment, but um, it's quite sort of contested and a lot of people are concerned that this isn't happening, something that's bit of work on this we obviously do at the moment. So, so there is stuff going on but it's often under the radar of academia and the IPCC. So maybe academics can play a role by identifying specific gaps and trying to draw together um, best practice and knowledge around what's happening, what's working, what's not, and actually put that into academic publications that can then inform the IPCC for the next report. So that might be a a good thing that, that can happen.
Oh, this has been really fun. Um, it's been really enjoyed the chance to talk about the the IPCC with you. Um, but um, is, is there anything else you think that uh, we've missed in our discussion? I've got a few thoughts, but um, first of all, we've got a COP coming up, haven't we? So, um, and there's been a lot of chat around the COP and the likely failings. Uh, and I think as a mitigation person, you might have some views on this. So I wonder what your thoughts were about the likely outcomes for the COP. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't follow it closely enough, but I know the thing that kind of makes me feel a bit uneasy, um, given uh, the kind of leadership of this COP, and the kind of fossil fuel contingent, right? And the kind of the, the, the sound of that voice. So for me, because I do these ways of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then storing them underground, something called carbon capture and storage is part of what's needed. Um, it can also be used though uh, to just reduce emissions from fossil fuels. And so what I'm seeing is a real muddying the water around what is a really useful set of technologies that um, keeps uh, for global society keeps the option of 1.5 uh, alive it keeps that option available because it allows you to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it underground and instead I'm seeing that really useful technology being uh, kind of misused to delay the kind of winding down of fossil fuels and that is something that I'm I'm on edge about and I'll be watching the COP quite carefully to see um, to see if there's any um, clarity there or any kind of continued kind of uh, space for misinterpretation of those sets of technologies so that's a very niche thing i suppose for my that's on that do you think there's any hope whatsoever that we could deploy these carbon capture or carbon removal technologies at sufficient scale without a massive reduction in emissions um you know very very rapidly you think we would deploy this at sufficient scale with you know this incremental approach to this area that we're seeing and a lot of sort of you know muddying delay could, could we deploy those technologies in a way that actually helped us to achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees or to stay below those thresholds? Or is this just a pipe dream? Is this pure greenwashing that's um, done in the full knowledge that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about carbon capture and storage, uh, carbon dioxide removal. We'll use that as an excuse to keep emitting. And we know damn well we're never going to stay below these these Paris thresholds. I don't know. There's, there's ways to use and misuse technology, isn't there? Um, and so all of those possible futures are out there. So yes, there is a coherent and logical and economical uh, way in which we continue to ramp up our efforts to reduce emissions, to phase down and phase out fossil fuels, and then to address some of the harder to decarbonize sectors. We need some of this technology, some of this carbon capture and storage, and then to go beyond that, to keep 1.5 an option, even if we've temporarily gone beyond that, we need to be able to um, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that works once we've got our emissions to zero, you get That's to net zero. And use the excuse for continuing. By some groups, yeah. then it is being positioned as being used differently. So yeah, I mean, that's where it comes back to the political that we discussed. So that that's my that's my, that's my my thoughts around the the upcoming COP. Yeah, okay. I mean, on the back of that, I guess my, my instinct is to be quite sort of pessimistic. And <laughs> um, yeah, I do a lot of work, admittedly on adaptation, but on sort of monitoring and evaluation. So you monitor the success of um, you know, a project or an intervention and you measure things at different levels. One is the output level. Have we have we sort of delivered the goods and services we said we're going to do? And that's easy to measure. The other one is at the outcome level, which is have we achieved the sort of short to medium term changes that we want to see? So, for example, people being better prepared for disasters or what have you. And then you have the impact level, which is the long term um, yeah, changes that you want to see. So it, typically for adaptation, they are or they should be things like, well, we want people to still have enough water, still have enough food to not be dying from heat. And so it's, you know, is society continuing to function? So if we're looking at um, mitigation, the impact level metric is, well, there are two of them. One is global CO2 concentrations and the other one is global temperature. All I see is those metrics going up and up despite all of the action that's going on. So it's like this we're doing really well at the output level and maybe at the outcome level there's just some progress but the impact level it seems like there's nothing happening i guess things would be even worse if we hadn't have done the mitigation we've done um but you know looking at it from my perspective it looks to me as if the world's governments have rather than getting together and, and saying oh we need to keep you know warming below 1.52 degrees they, they may as well have got together so okay so we've got a global policy goal of, of warming the planet by three degrees by the end of the century and that's sort of how it seems to be going um now, that may be sort of overly pessimistic and we might have a big turnaround, who knows? But, but I think given the current trajectories and the way the political economy is going uh, and what appears to be a sort of rolling back on the, on the actual practice of net zero, even if the rhetoric is still there and all the greenwashing that we've talked about, um, 
it seems that we're, we're going to be in a lot of trouble uh, over the next few decades and getting towards the latter half of this century. So going back from the COP to the IPCC, that just sort of really emphasizes to me that, that it's really important that you know, um, processes like the IPCC address you know, what these large and existential risks are at warming above 1.5 and above 2 degrees Celsius. So I think that needs to be a major focus in the light of what seems to me to be an ongoing failure to do adequate mitigation. Um, and actually, one thing that I haven't mentioned so far that I would like to see in the IPCC report um, is more learning from the past, actually. Uh, so, you know, sometimes when I, when I get the time, I do a little work on the archaeology of adaptation. So how did um, past societies actually you know, respond to rapid and severe climate change? And we're entering a phase, I think, where we're really talking about a, a reconfiguration, a reorganization of the global climate. Um, which will mean uh, redistribution um, of resources, changes in the, the distribution and availability of key resources like water, productive land. And so the world is going to physically look like a very different place. We're essentially going to be a different planet or a different configuration of, of the planet we're used to. And so the, the way we do things now, the systems, the distribution of infrastructure, distribution of people is going to have to change. Um, so we don't really have any recent analogues for this, at least at scale. But if we look back into the distant past, there are periods where um, the climate has reorganized itself. Um, one of the periods I look at is about five to 6,000 years ago, the Middle Holocene. And uh, this is when you know, the Northern Hemisphere deserts became deserts. Um, it's where sort of El Nino intensified. So we had a lot of really big changes. And there's a lot of evidence of people adapting to these really you know, dramatic changes there. And so while it doesn't present any direct analogues, certainly no policy analogues, um, I think it'd be great to see more content in the IPCC looking at how people adapted to really big reconfigurations in global and regional climates in the past, just to give us a general sense. And I think also one of the problems that we have with climate change is sort of a, a failure of the imagination. People don't really have the capacity to imagine a very, very different world. Um, and so by looking at how the world has changed in the past during episodes of climate change, uh, I think maybe that'll help us to think through some of the, some of these issues. And just what it means in general terms, in terms of how people uh, move, um, how people have to sort of radically reorganize their societies to cope with different environmental climatic conditions. And I'd like to see a bit more of that um, in the IPCC report in future. And then it's a balance out, I feel like a slightly more pessimistic end to our chat today. I'm going to go for a slightly more um, optimistic take, which is to say... A balance. That, exactly, got to have some balance. Um, which is to say, I think that when the last IPCC assessment came out, it in itself was this big media announcement. Whereas I've not seen anyone do the analysis yet, or they, or they have done it, I've not seen it. I feel like climate doesn't need to have a press release anymore because there's so much climate impacts and, you know, discussions about who's doing what around batteries and who's doing what around electric cars and, who, and you know, whether it's heat pumps in this country or, other, you know, like changes. I feel like it, there isn't... There, the conversation is so big and the impacts are so now that it doesn't have and i feel that has shifted does that make sense it, and so for so for me that kind of my optimism is that whenever you have like a transition out of something right you have the old incumbents like shouting loudly yeah. and pushing back like no no me 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 the world couldn't possibly like you know but it's only could be vhs or right you know these mobile phone things will never take off right and then we all sit here and chuckle so a little bit about your kind of analog spot on a different scale. I think that, um, I think that uh, you know, the momentum of climate impacts and the momentum of the desire for change among people and communities. Um, I'm not downplaying that there is a lot of pushback right now from vested interests, but I think that will, that that's what you get when somebody's on their final, right? They're on yeah. their they're they're on their final lap. That's uh, my more optimistic ending to our conversation today. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> anyway, this has been great. I've really enjoyed our chat. And uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, see what happens at the COP and uh, what happens in six, seven years with the next IPCC report. <laughs> <laughs>